The, the first thing I want to look at is just re kind of identify some of the components that we're seeing just from inside the motor. From our crankshaft, anybody remember what we attached there? What's that called? Drive. drive gear, right? And what do we call that? Primary drive gear. So in our particular dirt bike engines here, we have a gear uh, drive system. So one of the things we're going to get into in our four-stroke class as we move forward is we have different types of primary drives. We could have chain or we could have belt. So this is a common question for you guys. I believe on your lab sheet I might ask you what type of um, primary drive system you have and yours is gear because this gear is going to drive which gear? Right, it's going to drive the clutch basket here. So that's uh, going to be our couple to our transmission and the clutch is what's going to separate us from engaging and disengaging that power to the rear wheel. So we're going to take a look at those components and see what we have here. On our, as far as our primary drive gear, uh, you, since this is just a practice motor in the lab, I'm not using Loctite or torquing or anything else, but I will talk about the areas that are common to have Loctite. Does that make sense? So uh, on our, our clutch basket is attached to what? The main shaft. The main shaft of transmission. Good job. And then the main shaft drives the countershaft, counter shaft, which drives the rear sprocket and so on. So we're going to get into these mechanisms here for our shift drum and everything that we disassembled and uh, take a look at that as well. Some of the things I want you guys to think about is you may have not been asked to take something off, but it doesn't mean that the last guy didn't, right? So this little pin right here, why don't we zoom in on that and you'll see that there's, uh, there's flats on that, meaning that we could put a socket on there, a wrench, and remove that, right? So we need to be taking a look at ours and see if the last person messed with that. Now here's the, here's the negative. If I move it, so if I put a wrench on there and I move it, and it was tight, what did I just do to the Loctite that was on it? Broke it loose. You broke it loose and then it doesn't have an effect. Okay, so when, what I like to do is I will take, and let me grab the right size socket for that. I just want to simply put this on here and try to see if it's loose. I, I'm not going to get on here and actually crank it to where I'm going to break the Loctite, but if, if I can move this easily, what do I know? Right, you know, if, I, if, it's, if it's taking any effort, it's tight. Make sense? So it's just, it's a, it's a kind of a little bit of risk insurance, if you will. Make Give sense? You a chance by retorting. What's that? You then you'd have to pull it out, clean the threads, yeah. lock tight it, and start all over. And that's not a bad thing to do. If you want to, if, if, if you're working on a motor and you're concerned that that got removed, you would definitely want to do that. We'll get into a little more detail uh, on assembly of what that's actually doing here. We're going to keep looking through our other components. Uh, we also have a gear that attaches to our counter shaft that is going to be the idler gear between the kickstarter mechanism and the clutch basket which dr is driven drives this gear on the back side okay so we've got our primary drive drives our big one and our kickstarter is going to drive the the small one here so once it's flipped over we won't be able to see that but i'm going to take a look at what uh what components are of this clutch so let me move this out of the way and i'll just start to uh, I'll use this area right here to identify some of these pieces. On the clutch basket itself, the, the main basket has to spin free, okay? When we, what we're trying to do is this is not attached to the main shaft, okay? This, like I said, the crankshaft is going to drive this, okay? So anytime the, the engine is running, what's this basket doing? Spinning. Okay, so the, the outer basket here is always spinning. So let's keep looking through the components. So you can see here that there's some type of bushing, and this one's a bushing and a bearing combination, which by the way is extremely common to your two strokes, that it will have the ne needle bearing wrapped around the bushing. Make sense? Uh, or I think of the case, wasn't uh, Robert on the ARM85 uh, that instead of it having a solid bushing, the bearing went right onto the main shaft? Yeah. And then there's always going to be washers behind it and in front of it as well, like a stacked assembly. So let's see if this makes sense to you. For your understanding, when working on a clutch, there is some type of bearing assembly that has to be supported on both sides. Yes. Okay. So on this one here, it's going directly against the clutch basket. There is not another washer in here, but there may need to be. And how are you going to know if there is one? Okay, parts fish. Another little tip here that you'll be able to uh, tell. Let's say there's supposed to be a washer in here. 
to move this further out from the, off the main shaft. Are you, are you with me? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So one way I could tell if a washer is missing without going to the microfish is by the alignment of the gear that it mates with. Okay, so I want you to look at something. If this required a washer, what I might, and it's, and it's gone, what I might see is something like this. Do you see how the gears don't line up right here? Mm -hmm. Okay, or what if you end up with a situation like this? Is there something wrong? Yeah, no matter what, yeah, you put something in there that shouldn't be in there. No matter what, when gears are engaged, would you agree that it's called full contact? Oh, yeah. Okay, does that, that make sense right there? Yep. Okay, so as we move into transmissions and you guys are going to be shifting those transmissions on a bench and you're going to be engaging a gear set for like first or second or third, you need full contact. If you just give me something like this or something like this, you understand that that is incorrect. You with me? Would a worn shift fork create one of these conditions? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, well, our best friend is just go to microfish and find out whether we actually need something or not. Make sense? Okay. So let's look at uh, this uh, idler gear. This is a real simple setup here. Nothing special about it. There's a bushing on the inside. Do you see the dimples in there? Yeah. Anybody know what those are for? Oil, Oil what? Retention. Retention, yeah, that's what helps that oil stay in there. So that's a design of that bushing. It's not always going to be there. Sometimes, with a with a bear, with a excuse me, a bushing like this, this is going to allow a tighter fitment than the one without the holes because the oil can be retained in there. Does that make sense? So one more is a faster. What? The other one. Yep. And these aren't common to wear out, by the way. It's not something real common on ours. Um, this is, uh, how often is this spinning? Let's look at what it's attached to. This is attached to this gear. It's rotating all the time. It's always spinning. What happens here is when we engage, I'll go ahead and uh, it's installed here. Go here. So you guys are going to be using liberal amounts of uh, assembly lube, right? Yeah. And now that we're on the transmission side, and I went to the microfish this morning, I verified the, the order of these. The shim does go on the outside. And we could look at the microfish to, to verify that. Uh, um, Verify, verify that as well. I have a question about the idler. Is that is the name idler gear used for any gear that links the Kickstarter to the actual spinning mechanism, mechanized parts of the engine, or is an idler gear a name for a gear that's always just free with like that and linking other parts? Uh, the, I would say by definition, it's a, a gear that is not, it's just rotating around a shaft. It doesn't drive the shaft. Yeah. It drives a connection path between a set of gears. I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate the Kickstarter and how it engages here. Right now, what I want you to notice here is that as this is spinning, okay, take a look here. I put a Kickstarter on here, and what's happened is this is actually... This is not kicking out here. So do you see how it freewheels right now? Yeah. See how the gear freewheels? So when that clutch is spinning, that'll go all the time, okay? But what happens here is when I hit the Kickstarter, there's a piece in the back side of this that moves out on a cam and kicks into the gear, and now watch what happens. So here, it freewheels, right? Well, when I go here, see how it's locked up? And now, watch what happens. I rotate this gear clockwise. What's that do to the clutch basket? And I got a problem. It has a larger diameter than this. This needs to be on first. See how the gear gets in the way? It won't actually pull off. Make sense? So is this basically a four-stroke transmission looks like two on the side? Well, a dirt bike, this is the exact same thing. As they made the motor a four-stroke, they they didn't change really any of this. Yep, this is real common to your four-wheelers and anything. Yep. 
Okay, so you can see here how this is working, how that road, how that engages that gear. I'm going to go ahead and slip the clutch basket in place. And to get this, I just if it doesn't go in all the way, and see how we have that depth in there, is I just rotate this, it snaps down. You see how it, it dropped in? So now, see how the clutch turns? Right, right. And then that's the next piece of it. What I'm trying to get you guys to think about is... The idler gear went clockwise, which it always drives the gear next to it opposite, so it's going counterclockwise, which means it's going to drive the engine what direction? Forward. Clockwise and forward. Make sense? Okay, so uh, this, this one here is going to require the primary to be fully on before we do that too. Before I put this in, you guys are going to be putting these spacers in on the main or on the crankshaft here and you can see here where there's witness marks of where they rode before okay now on somebody's vehicle in here we went ahead and flipped it so that the wear mark would be moved to a different spot was that yours mm -hmm. what would we ideally want to do to the to this replace bushing replace. yeah we just want to replace it we put new crank seals in where's which bushing if you will is the most commonly wore one crank of the whole two stroke on the chain drive, on the output of that chain drive, the sprocket, because it gets all the mud and everything around it. So watch uh, my technique here as I install this. This oil seal already has some lube on it. What I do is I just don't want to sit and push it in because I could fold the oil seal. So what I'm doing is I'm going to rotate this as I snap it into place. Make sense? Yep. Okay. Get our uh, drive gear on. Now another thing you'll notice here is do you see how the, the crankshaft is recessed inside of the gear yeah. okay so if if that was not doing that I would be concerned because there's no way that the bolt could torque it down if this was sitting above this surface I would not be able to clamp the two together that's a little engineering piece right there does that make sense yeah. okay so we're not torquing here uh, this is an extremely common fastener to have Loctite, by the way. And what's that tool you guys are going to use to uh, tighten these down? Gear jammer. A gear jammer or a penny, right? I can go back in here now and get my uh, clutch on here. I still got to put my shift stuff on. I'm just wanting to focus on the clutch right now for you guys, okay? So I'm fully seated in here, and now you'll be able to see the, the crankshaft actually turning. Oh, there's no piston in this. And now you can see that we're going the right direction to crank it over. So once you let off, it disengages that. So that means that these gears are still spinning all the time. And that's why we have to inspect those and look for, uh, you know, that the bushings are good and that there's not any metal-to-metal uh, -metal, uh, contact on that. Make sense? Let's take a look here and see if we can see with the camera what our alignment looks like. Can you guys see in there that it's actually dead on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, right in the middle of that, so we're looking good. How fast is it rotating? Chance, that's a great question. What we have is uh, no one has specifications to say exactly like this dirt bike <clears throat> kicks over to a certain RPM. From what I've uh, either read or been told, it's somewhere around six or 700 RPM. And we need about 950, uh, an engine will about stay idling at around 900 RPM. And matter of fact, in Japan, there's actually contests uh, of engine builders of how low they can make a bike idle. And there's, uh, I heard, I, you know, we should Google this or what. And I heard about this a couple years ago at Sturgis that supposedly there's a guy that can make a Harley idle at like 700 RPM or 650 RPM. And it literally goes, Boom, 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 you know, real, to give that real thump or whatnot, it'd be really hard on the engine, but playing with the ignition and timing, we don't know what the secret is, but uh, these guys were talking about it, Sturgis, about uh, that that's the biggest craze over there is how low you can make a bike idle. Metric motorcycle, Harleys like to run 900 to 1,000 RPM. Most guys like to have them around that 900, and they sound like they just want a tractor or they want to die, if you will. Um, Metric motorcycles really like around 1200, 1300 RPM. They like a little bit higher idle and you get that real smoothness to it. A lot of guys will take their Honda V-Twins and turn their idle down much lower than spec or Robert even on your Kawasaki Vulcan 
so that you uh, um, you get that low idle or whatnot, and it just about wants to die. And when you pull up to a stoplight, you got about to blip the throttle or whatnot. That is completely copying a Harley thing. Yeah. Your metric motorcycles will uh, tend to idle nice and smooth. So the 600 RPM or 700 RPM of the Kickstarter, the idea there is, is I got to spin that crankshaft fast enough to draw an air fuel charge in or inject it and have ignition. Once I have combustion, it's going to pick up faster and run to that idle speed. Make sense? So uh, you, the reason you need to think about this too is what about recoils? What about you starting lawnmowers, starting chainsaws, starting snowblowers, things like that? Gives you kind of an idea that if you are if you're weak, and I don't mean because of your physical size, but there's been times where I've been injured or so sick that I couldn't pull a snowblower over, let's say. I will not be able to start it if I can't get enough RPM to spin that to basically have fuel drawn in and ignition happen. Does that make sense? A couple years ago, I had some uh, bruised ribs and I could not pull my snowblower over. I literally, it had an electric start feature with a plug-in on it and I had to do that. I just, I, I physically could not um, stretch enough to be able to, to start that. And uh, that's a great example of what that looks like. A lot of times you have technicians come in, they'll say, hey, this I can't get this snowmobile running or it has weak spark. If you can't spin it fast enough, it's going to have weak spark. The same thing on this dirt bike. If you go to kick it over and you got a sore knee and you just give it kind of a real slow kick through, you won't spin it fast enough to give it a good strong spark. So those are some considerations we'll get into when we do electrical. Sound good?